Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on our quarterly podcasting crew event because it is always a fun time to chat with other podcasters. And it's always a good time to kind of pick their brains and see what's happening. So who are our guests today on the show? Well, our guests today are obviously... And always, Jeff Haas and Barney Smith, of course. Jeff Haas is from the Traversing the Stars podcast, and Barney Smith is from Story Comic Podcast. How are you guys doing today? Doing good. How about yourself? Well, doing good. Doing good. Good. I've, I've been swamped with this darn film I've been working on, so I've had to reschedule a lot of stuff, figure out how to actually plan my life around something other than a podcast. It's kind of a new new factor for me. <laughs> All right, I have to go, Mom. I'm in, Mom, I'm in a meet. I'm I'm in a podcast with Kurt Sasso and Jeff Haas. Okay, okay. All right. Yes, 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 yes. I'll I'll tell them that you said hi. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Mom. She's my mother. She 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 loves watching you guys, and she just really wanted to make sure that she knew that that you, oh. that. Uh, yeah, but it's all, that she said, said hi. Well, yeah. she's your, is she happy that you're hanging out with your little friends? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that a cult are you in a cult no no mom we're just podcasters it's okay it's the same thing let's face it was we're, we're, we're small we're unusually dedicated to this one thing <laughs> we're, we're, we're really good at what we do yeah yes i mean we're the followers <laughs> <laughs> so today it's my turn to host as as usual i mean we've been cycling this around our, our various shows here and it's been a good time overall I think we everybody's learned. drinking. Yeah, that's right. Look at so do you see my do you see my 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 cup? Go ask you. Go ask nice. Yeah. See. Yeah. <laughs> that's perfect. I love it. You can tell so, we're the cool kids. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I should have had my hat on or something. You know that had insert slogan here. But <laughs> when it comes to obviously the show itself, we we dive into a lot of different things. Uh, let's do a quick summary as to what what's been happening to us at least in the past. She went since our last conversation. We'll start with Jeff, since you're on the screen here. All right. Uh, what's been up with me? I'm still doing my show, uh, closing in on, uh, well, I'm at two and a half years. So I'm closing nice. on my third. Had some good guests of late, some uh, Rachel and Cheryl from Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lena, welcome Star Trek. The girl who plays the little pig nose girl in Sweet Tooth. I um, interviewed her recently, interviewed the character, the woman who, who voices Rock Talk and Star Trek Prodigy. So I've, I've had some good stuff. I'm closing in on 900 subscribers. So I'm like right around the corner or the big number. So um, yeah, that's that's me so far. How about you, Bernie? What's been going on you, you, between your radio gig and, and your podcast there? It's, it's pretty fun. So I, this was actually the, you know, as we mentioned in our last round table, I bought a radio station and now I've been in it now for over nine months things are it, it's picking up it's picking up a lot so it's actually been pretty fun but on, on the podcast side i've been having the most delightfully random guest requests coming in like so basically what happened was it was a few months ago i got messaged by saying hey they said would you be able to have chad willardson on i'm like sure I had to look him up. He's this, he's this guy that's like this huge, like financial advisor guru. That's like, writes all these like top 10 books on Amazon. And I'm like, all right, my, my podcast called story comic presents, but we'll go, we'll go for it. I had a great time. But since I did that, I've had these, I've had, I've had completely like people that just don't fit within the mold of my <laughs> traditional mold of what I usually have on. Mm-hmm. I just had on my show, Teresa Payton, who was the former white house CIO chief Inf- information officer on, and she wrote a book about cybersecurity and she came on. We had a great, we had a great conversation. We talked for a uh, half hour and I've, I've, been, I've taken your advice. You guys, when we've been, talked before, this is the best thing about it. Like when we talk, when the three of us talk and, you know, when we, when, when we have Cody on too, I learn a lot from talking to you, get to you, to you folks on this. I'm like, that's a great idea. I should try this. I should try this. And one of them was being able to, to work a lot with doing shorts because we talked last time, you guys do a lot of good shorts. I've been pushing out shorts daily now. I just put a like a draft like daily. And now I've been seeing um finally my numbers are are trying to catch up to you guys. I mean, I might hit 500 this weekend. So I'm pretty excited about that. Nice. I've never had 500 subscribers. My audio has always been gangbusters. People listen to my interviews way more than they watch him, but that's what I'm pretty excited about. So it's that little dopamine fix by watching <laughs> those numbers trickle up a bit. 
Yeah, it's it's hard when you see your YouTube stats kind of just dip at the start of the month and then they slowly start to rise. It's like, okay, I think I'm still doing okay. <laughs> you know, it's one yeah, of those so, things. Well, see, when, when I did the math for, for my show, I need to average a new subscriber every single day to get to 1,000 on my third year anniversary, which is the goal of mm-hmm. November 1st. So I need literally one almost every single day. Yesterday I lost two subscribers, and I my, my literally my day was ruined. I was like, I was like, kept staring. I was like, where did they go? Who are these people? Why did you leave me? <laughs> I need my thousand. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, I'm reaching. I'm at 951 as of this interview itself. It goes up and down. I mean, I, I've kind of stopped. I care because I want to get to a thousand, but. I know my watch hours are not going to hit 4,000 hours, which is their monetization factor. But the fact that it's reaching 1,000 people, the fact that you have 1,000 people or whatever number you have doesn't matter really. That's still a number that you haven't had in the past, and that's still more people than you've reached in the previous day or month or whatever. So it's small wins, I think. Well, I mean, I'm sure you know, like, if you get to 1,000 subscribers, you don't need the 4,000 watch hours. So, so you got to make the money. It's either 1,000 subscri- subscribers or 4,000 watch hours. It's not, it's, not one, it's not both. You need one or the other. I thought it was both. No, I, I'm going to have to other. reread that then. <laughs> oh, no, no, because it says a thou- you either need 1,000 subscribers or um, 4,000 watch hours to start uh, monotonizing it. It's not both. If, oh. if I get to a 4,000 watch hours without 1,000 subscribers, I still will be making money on it. <laughs> Okay. Well, so, um, actually, so I'm I'm pulling this up now. So we're gonna we're gonna see this in real time. Eligibility is that you need you sh- you need at least 500 subscribers and three video uploads in the last 90 days, and one of the following. So you need those two, and one of the following. Um, at least 3,000 watch hours, mm-hmm. or three million short views short views yeah so yeah no i think yeah uh, yeah, it's 10 million for the uh for the four thousand uh or 10 million short views it's arbitrary i think i think if you don't factor in that yes monetization is great but i think the fact that you're reaching a different audience you're reaching us an audience that with your shorts you're reaching an audience with your long form content you're just reaching new people is really what it is and if you keep that in mind then uh, losing subscribers really sh- it sucks i agree <laughs> I've, I've been there before but as soon as you gain one it's one more person whether they're real or fake or whatever and we'll, we won't dive into that here <laughs> I don't know. I, I just want my thousand. I mean, yeah. if they're all fake, I'll take it. I don't care. For myself, I've been, because of this this whole film thing, I haven't done a, too much, but I've been still releasing some short, uh, well, I'm releasing some short content because uh, Justin Koch has, an, has a current uh, campaign with his SWAT Eldritch Blue, uh, which is, which I had a great conversation with him and Rachel Disler a while back. Uh, glad that they're finally getting their campaign going. It felt like that thing was in purgatory for a long time because of numbers or whatever the case may be but, it, it's a zoo i must admit yeah for a platform i do not recommend zoo mm-hmm. uh, for those who don't know i'm the publicist of uh justin coke so i'm a little biased in this <laughs> a lot of the issue is that zoo is just not a great platform because one there's, there's a drop off in crowdfunding anyway and if you're only going to get a certain x number of people to back your book there's only x number of people who have zoo compared to kickstarter so it automatically um, kind of undercuts you just a little bit right off the bat by using Zoop, but it's easier to use. Yeah, I still kind of want to get the the creators of Zoop on the show, just kind of pick their brains because I've done. What are, I I'd like to do Kickstarter. I'd like to. Do, I think I've already done one of the other major ones as well, uh, but I'd like to do Zoop too. So oh, Indiegogo. Yeah, I, I think I've done them. I, it's been a a while probably since I've chatted, but I, I think I've done one or two other crowdfunding campaigns in the past. But I've been releasing. Uh, more content in general, just kind of on my weekly basis as I normally have it. Some past guests have come back on the show. I was actually a guest on a few other shows uh, recently. One was called the Hump Day Podcast or Hump Day Calls, I should say, uh, show. Guy out of Florida. Nice guy. I had a good conversation about the podcast itself. Is it a hobby? Is it a business? Things like that. Mm. I think that's a good question I kind of want to bring up here. Personally, I think being a podcaster, uh, it's a business. It can be a business if you have the right model. Too many people, because podcasts are free, 
to the masses and the various platforms that they subscribe to, which we will never see any of that money, is available to everyone in all around the world. And I think that's amazing. But what do you guys think about the preconceived notion, I should say, that podcasting is a hobby or can it be a business? How about I go first? So here's this is this is my this is my t- is that I'm putting on my MBA hat for a second here. I like wearing this once in a while because do I see this with my you know with my skill set? Do I see this my, the the podcast I've been doing for over four years as as a business? No, because I'm not treating it like a business. I'm mm-hmm. treating it like a passion and a hobby. Because here's the thing: the best, the most successful podcasts are actually part of a brand. And it's not the and it's not the entirety of your brand. So you'll look at a really good one that I watch is um that the grim and mild one. What's his name? Aaron, uh, what's his name? He does that lore, but he has a bunch of other podcasts he does. And through that, he has a brand. He does the shows on the road. Um, stuff you should know. It's these two guys, they banter back and forth, they do a lot of stuff. They have other things within their brand, and they don't rely solely on their podcast to bring them money. And so ultimately what it comes down to, if it's a business, whatever you spend on there, you have to make twice that amount in order to be a successful business. So when I look at, when I get those automatic, you know, pod bean dings of like once a year, when I see, I get, I get slammed with a annual bill. I'm like, I'm not making any money. Like, it's like, but that's, the, but that's, but that's also comes down when you also mentioned with like the Kickstarter piece, is it a hobby and a passion or are you, or is it a business? And when you see how much money people spend on how much people spend on, on making a book or making a comic and they go on the Kickstarter and then they bite, they, they shoot themselves They you know, they, 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 they kick themselves when they actually say, I just want to get my book out. I don't care if, and I'm the last one to get paid. Mm. You, you, my friend, just just said you don't want to make money doing this. If you're not spending, if you're not actually with the mindset of making twice the amount of money that it's taking you actually the money you you spend, then you're not making a livable wage on it. If you're not making a livable wage on it, if if what you're making isn't paying your health insurance, then it's a passion, um, and it's a hop. And using the word hobby seems like it's a bad word, but it, it's basically a passion. You love doing it. And for me, I love doing my podcast. I love doing it because I get to meet new people. I have met so many nice people. Frankly speaking, if I didn't start my podcast, I never would have met Jeff. I never would have met Kurt if I didn't do this. And my life is richer because I've been doing my podcast. My life is richer. My wallet isn't richer, (laughs) but my life is richer because I've met you. I've met met the two of you and I've met other people through doing a podcast. I'm going to change the wording. It's not a business. It's not a hobby, it's a pursuit. Um, because the goal eventually, there is a potential to monotonize if you do become successful enough to pull it off. It's a question of time. Um, it's not, I think it's even more of a question of when, not if. Uh, and then a question of how much are you going to make once you start doing it. I think it's a pursuit. You're doing something you enjoy. You're doing something with a goal in mind. Um, to call it a hobby, I think, is to minimize what you're doing, but to call it a business is to take it serious, too, too serious. Um, and you're, you're you're not when you're not making money on it, it's not a business up, or it's a business that is so in the red that it should have gone uh, bankrupt a long time ago. So I would call it a pursuit. Basically, you're bleeding out every every single day, every single month, every single year until basically you either stop doing your podcast or you make it enough that you can actually pay off, uh, you know, any debt you have. Well, but it's a good point that like, it's a good point. What you brought up too, is like talking about that as a pursuit or something. And it's something you have to believe in when you do though. The reason why the, the, the three of us are still doing it for so long is because we believe in the medium and we believe in what we're doing. It's the same thing. Like, Nobody ever goes to school and becomes a teacher and says, I'm being a teacher because I want to buy that freaking yacht. Yeah, I'm going to make so much money being a teacher. You're doing it because you love what you do. I see what we do here is as we are an, an, an invaluable asset to the arts. We provide a service that we're not asking to get paid for in, in a way. And that's when when someone reaches out, say, hey, can I be a guest on your show? Yeah, sure. 
You know, it's I'm gonna say, as, as someone who is a teacher, I felt that a little too hard. <laughs> I was like, oh, Wait. Seth, you are broke. There's no way out in our future whatsoever. You, you don't have your yacht yet, Jeff? What's that? What's oh, going God, on? I, don't have, I don't have a yacht. I, I, I can't even afford a, a little fake. A toy boat that can on the thing with remote control. Like, I can be proud of the SS. Oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> oh God, that's that's your that's the first time when you wake up in the morning. Oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> I, I think the first thing is uh, I'm glad I haven't stored myself to death. That would be the the first thing. How's your file organizational structure for your show? Because I get I have a ton of like I'm organized by year basically. Yeah, mine's organized by um. I just have them uh, by uh, episode number. Hmm. Name. Uh, I, yeah, my, mine. I have files saved by name. I, I'm run out of space on my computer so quickly. So I buy hard yeah. drives. I, I got Google two terabytes on Google Cloud. Oh yeah, but it's but it takes like three hours to like move one episode over. So it's just like fuck it. I don't have an hour of my life to spend doing this. You know, the, the fact that we've been doing this in our various circles for so long, um, some longer than others, but, you know, age is relative and so is time, I guess, for that matter. But when it comes to the podcast and the shows that you guys have created, what's your end goal? How long are you actually going to keep doing this and why? All right. Let me. Yeah. So I, I would say I haven't even thought about that. I don't know if it's just more of like, you know, like the. I think it's because I've been pacing myself. Like I remember a few a, a few uh, roundtables ago where Jeff was talking about Jeff was doing like what you say you're like doing like five or six a week or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same with Cody. Yeah. <laughs> because I pace myself pretty well, and I'm actually in charge of my own time in that sense, where I don't feel obligated. I used to feel obligated to take on anybody that reached out. I I guess for me it's that when I don't find it rewarding anymore but i don't see it I, it's so fun i guess, i guess the point of it is that i don't see me stop doing it because i'm not taking it seriously and i love doing it and i i i genuinely enjoy talking to people so i mean that's that's the whole point of buying a radio station is because i like talking to people <laughs> for me i think the goal is as long as i'm showing adequate growth hmm. i'll be happy um, to continue if i do hit that hard wall where you know i'm not noticing an improvement in guest level, level of guests if i'm not seeing an improvement in subscriber or view count over some point i may grow tired of it and it becomes more hassle potentially than it's worth um but i think as long as i see growth and i feel like people are paying attention to it because i don't want to do this just for myself i guess i mean I'm not that chatty, but um, <laughs> as long as it's growing, I think I'm gonna. I'm, I, I think I will continue with it. Um, as long as there's a goal in mind I can reach, I think I continue. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't. I don't know if there's a point where I'm just gonna be like, this is boring. I'm getting tired of, mm. you know, because it takes. I think my, the number I thought in my head is that it's four hours per episode of work. When you do talk about the prepping, editing, the conversation, the promoting. It's about four hours. I think I I think I put in per episode. When the the growth is not equal to the hassle, <laughs> um, I think I would stop at that point. I I think for me it's it's been such a long journey in itself, and I've learned so much from the audio side of things to switching to video to uh, finding a, a higher caliber level of guest, even though that seems like it's few and far between, but conversations uh you know getting guests back on after say a decade is always fun to, to to do as well i think that's a great avenue when it comes to saying you know call back to past episodes getting maybe people to look at your past content that they maybe haven't seen or weren't alive to see <laughs> you know there's there's that generational gap when it comes to to that aspect but i think it also comes to you know what else are, are am i going to do like I, I, I've seen the change of, of technology. I've seen the change of different styles of content that gets released. It's ever changing. It's no longer about who the guest is. It's about what they're talking about or what they're saying or what they're promoting. So there's many different levels of, of ways you could put content out there. It just depends on, on how, if you want to change your style or if you want to change what you're doing. But I think I've, 
I've had such a, an easy going with this particular format of just talking a one-on-one in a conversational approach that it just kind of makes it just feel like a regular day at the office, so to speak, where I'm just talking with a friend, whether they're known to me personally, or this is the first time. <laughs> you, you bring up that good point as well about how things are changing. And I went to a broadcasters conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, myself being always the optimist, he was talking about AI and all the things that are happening with AI. And he mentioned the stuff that he was talking about. He said, it's going to be happening months down the road, not years down the road. Like he's talking about AI is advancing at such breakneck speed mm-hmm. that he said every single town in the United States within months is going to have its own personalized feed of an AI newscaster that's going to giving you ai news like new personalized news about your specific town and the the specific weather and it'll pull it up and it's actually it will be a newscaster looking basically human hi jeff here's the news that's happened in your in your neighborhood and it'll look just like a news thing and it'll pull up like videos just like a just a regular old newscast it'll pull the news from say like your local school board minutes or your local mayor's meetings or whatever that's happened. And then I'll talk about the weather. I'll talk about the local sports that might've happened in your local high school. And then it'll last for five minutes or 10 minutes. And he said that AI is going at such a breakneck speed that everybody is going to have, if you go to anybody's website, you're going to have two pages on there. That's going to say privacy policy in terms of use. Every uh, every website is going to have privacy policy in terms. You always you, you should have if you don't have that. For those that are listening or watching, if you have your own website, you need to have a privacy policy in terms of use. Put those in there. But now he's saying that every website is going to have to have, or even in our show notes, for instance, on our podcast, you have to have an AI policy listed, like what you used AI for, and it's talking about that ourselves as brands that we have determined what our guidelines are using AI and what our guardrails are. What are the things that we can promise our listeners and viewers that we did not use AI for? AI is going to make our jobs way easier and and more complicated at the same time. It depends on where you're sitting at. And I know we've talked before about this. It's not going away. It's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point of how are we going to be able to use this as podcasters to make our lives easier? And how are we using it to actually reach our goal of being in front of, because let's be, let's be very clear is that we are competing with every other media for eyes and ears. We're competing with everybody. When that comes down to the point of how do we get those returning subscribers? Mm -hmm. Because I'll pull up my statistics I might have just shown somebody a video that did really well or an interview that did really well because people liked the person I was talking to. It was irrelevant that it was me asking the questions. So how do we promote our brand itself is like we're asking different and unique questions. How are we going to be able to stand stand out for that? But like you, like you mentioned, Kurt, it's, I guess my this is my question then that to two of you. How will you not... If you say, I'm not using AI whatsoever, you will eventually somehow, like even if it's predictive te- text, we already use it. If you're on your phone and you're typing to somebody, you're already using AI if it starts to like predict what your next sentence is going to be. If you're using it as a spell checker, spell checker is, is, is basic, is, is, is a version of AI. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, that's so- a dictionary, but yeah, it's. <laughs> Well, I, I get what you're saying there, Brian, but I, I think it also, and I, here's the one thing that I did in the, in the last couple of months since our conversation was I actually attended an AI conference. I was at a four day event, basically it came down to about two hours of content from a host perspective and a guest perspective in terms of the content they were creating. They were all podcasters. So that's, that was the only common consistent factor. And they had a variety of different topics they were talking about. A lot of the content was in regards to, well, how do I create my own podcasting avatar? How do I create uh, my own images, et cetera? Personally, for me, I, I really hate and I cannot stand AI art whatsoever. I will not support that in any way, shape or form because it's just ridiculous. Because of the circles that we're in specifically when it comes to entertainment and comics, et cetera, 
it is a blatant disregard to their creative talents. That's all I'm going to say on that. I posed the question to one of them saying, so one of them was talking about how to create their own uh, AI image content or whatever for a thumbnail, let's say. And I asked them, so I said, so what are the legal ramifications of using AI in terms of content that could be stolen from actual creative people? Right. And it took them five minutes to, in a very long dead air pause, they basically quoted a legalese thing that they were told to say which was, yeah. you know, make sure that you're using the proper content, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Yes, AI is here to stay. That's fine. That's understandable. But from a text perspective, yes, it makes our lives easier. From a title perspective, it may make it more interesting. From a content perspective of what three sentences are going to generate for your podcast or whatever, that maybe is better than what you've actually written yourself because you're going to edit this content any any way, shape, or form. It's just giving you a brief guideline to of what to work with. Then it comes back to how exactly is it making your life easier? You know, does that amount of time, does it, it takes to generate the content you're looking for, does it make your life easier than what you what you could have done yourself? If the answer is yeah. yes, then good. If it's a, if it's a time factor, then awesome, great, that's fine. YouTube right now has stipulations where it has check marks before you can even post any content that says, "Is this does any of this content, any content, g- is it generated by AI?" And if you check yes, it'll it'll watermark it as AI. If you check no, it won't watermark it whatsoever. Right. But we're getting to the point where we're understanding what AI looks like. Because we're seeing similar word patterns, we're seeing similar phrasing, we're seeing similar image generation to the point that how unique are you actually going to become? And it's difficult. Right. Yeah. I don't use um, AI uh, on my podcast. I don't really think I'm going to. Um, I will say um, to make Barney happy (laughs) that I've started using ChatGBT for putting together some school stuff. It is getting you, so just you know, it's a, a nod up to to you, Barney. <laughs> but um, for my podcast, um, I don't know. I don't think I, I need it. Yeah. Um, the show notes are not that hard to write. The titles are not. I don't know. They're not. Maybe not. They're not original, but they're easy to write. Um, and, the, and the questions. Um, there's an, a chat bot out there that's recent enough to ask the question I'm going to ask in a way I'm going to want to ask them. So I don't utilize it at all at the moment. And I think for me, it, we've done this long enough that we know what types of questions we were, we're going to ask. And the fact that we're doing research ourselves, we're not using really, we're not using AI to do research because if we know who the guest is, like your your quality of guests there, Jeff, are well known in the industry, in, in the entertainment industry. So you have a, a huge plethora of research to go through, which I don't envy you whatsoever, by the way. I think it's amazing the guests you have on, but I think the yeah. amount of research you have to do sounds like a pain in the ass, to be perfectly honest. Enjoyable. It's enjoyable, but it sounds like a pain in the ass. It, 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 I don't think it's as tough as making it sound. I mean, I prep 10 questions for my guests now. I will say there's there's at least three of them that are redund- uh, repetitive. What inspired you? How to get involved? What's next? The other seven are where the research comes in. I will say it's more expensive than it is hard. Um, I got to buy the comic books. I got to watch the TV show. They got to go to the movie. Uh, but because I do focus almost part, entirely on what that one project is that they're doing, it's not as much research as you may think that it is. Like I, when I interviewed um, John Pisano, who did um, King of the Pan of the Apes, I watched the movie. I sat down. I, I mean, I, I went to the theater, I watched the movie, and then I spent some time listening to the music. But it wasn't like I went to the library and opened a book on. Uh, you know, the history of Planet of the Apes in compositional music. You know, so it's, I don't think it's as bad as, as, as it sounds like it is. It's probably, I don't know, it takes me about 25 minutes, 30 minutes to write the questions. If I watch a movie, it's three hours watching, the, you know, two and a half hours to watch the movie, listen to the music. I'm probably spending about an hour listening to the music to prepare. If I got to read the comic books. If, if it's like issue six of a comic book series, I'm not reading all six issues. Right. I'm usually reading the first one, the last one. And then either the second or the fifth, if there's six issues, to make sure I understand how I got to it or where I, it started from. But I'm, not, I'm very, it's rare that I'll buy all six. One, because I don't have the money. And two, because mm-hmm. I don't have the time. And also, you don't really need to. No one's going to listen to a uh, step by step examination of every issue of a comic book series. So read the first, read the sixth, read something in the middle, you know, second or fifth, uh, depending on how I go about it. 
And some of it after that point, you can kind of just infer. Like I interviewed um, J.M. DeMattis just recently, um, a couple of days ago. And we were talking about a Shadow of the Gob Green Goblin. I read issue one, I did issue three. Like I said, so it's, I don't, it's not quite as much work as I think it is. Like I used to, when I started doing uh, Spoiler Country, I would spend all that time going back, go through their whole history and how they got there and their acting style. And I would research the acting style. But I was like, no one gives a shit. No one's going to listen to that. No one's going to sit through that. Um, I got these people maybe for 15, 20 minutes of their time to watch. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to spend time off topic. So it's not, I don't think it's as much research as it seems like it is. There is some, it's just not as much as people may yeah. understand. I mean, like I said, I mean, if, I, if I'm interviewing a composer, and I will try to get the music. I will listen to most of the songs, sometimes more than once, to get a sense of what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I'm not going back and um, researching why a violin gets used in the second part of a <laughs> structure of blog. Because I mean, I don't care. No one cares. Right. I, you know what I'm saying? So I don't quite go that deep. It's, it's not quite John Williams that you're interviewing type deal. It's, you know, it, this was right. really moving music. I really enjoyed it. You know, oh, I loved how this sequence came in blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, usually what we'll do is I'll find um, this 20 songs, I'll go through maybe 10 of them, and then I'll pick out, like, that's an interesting piece of sound that he hit right there. What is that? Why would he use it? And then I'd ask him that question, they'll answer it, and I'll move on. And because I picked out one piece out of it, it sounds like I'm smarter than I am, and I just go from there. Yeah, I completely understand. That kind of dives into another question here. Something that happened to me recently <laughs> like 10 years ago, I had a guest on the show and I got an email from them recently because they saw the, one of their past, the, their only interview that was ever done on the show was up online and they asked me to take it down. And I'm thinking, well, okay, what's, what, do, what is the absolute reasoning behind that? And they said to me, well, that was a geek phase in my life and I want and I've moved on from that. You know, what, what would you do in that type of situation? Barney, want to hit it first, or I'll go first. I'll go first on this one. Then Barney, yeah, go first. A couple of things. First, was there an agreement that they could take it down whenever they wanted? Um, is only is it was up there as their courtesy? Um, second question would be: Is there a legalese involved? Is there a legal? Like I had this one guest. I'm not gonna say who he was, mm -hmm. but I was um, I was interviewing him, and he talked about the fact that the country that he came from, which was in Africa, mm -hmm. there was like I guess it's being run by a very dictatorial guy. And he was insulting him on the show. And he messaged me, um, actually after I uh, released the episode, he contacted me, he goes, hey, uh, I was thinking about that. I do go home once in a while and maybe I shouldn't have this, I shouldn't be saying this on your show because he's kind of a bad dude and he could kill me. And so I went back and I edited it out. It was like, you know what? Good point. I don't want to be the reason why someone gets murdered, unless that would be a great episode, but you don't know. It would depend. Is there a legalese involved? Is it a lawyer who contacts me? Was no, there an no. agreement that um, I've had some guests tell me before the interview, I have the right to edit. So anything that's there, I, mean, I can have the right to cut. So I might have to, I, I got to be more careful with that one. But if it's just some guy saying I feel uncomfortable with that episode, oh, there's that one guy, you know, who is a former client. He said, hey, I did a live show with him. I posted, he goes, can you take that down for me? <laughs> no, my yeah. fucking views. The one thing I got out of this whole damn thing was my 15 views. I'm keeping it. Yeah, you know, I dare you. You're not going to make any money on it. But um, it, it really would be a question of the reason behind it. What was the agreement before the show started? And also, uh, what is the cost of me keeping it up? Like, am I losing 100 views, 1,000 views? Am I losing five? Yeah. What's the cost? Because it was like nine years ago, no agreement was in place whatsoever. There's no legal involvement. There's nothing in regards to any stipulations. What he did back then, which was interesting at the time got me about 500 views that's when the restrictions were a lot looser <laughs> on youtube when they weren't throttling absolutely everything because of whatever searchability etc and the fact that my my website also has like his name attached to it as well but my website's been borked for years now so i can't do anything about that I'm still fixing it by the way if i set it to private it was fine because unlisted does absolutely nothing on YouTube these days because it means nothing. It just got to the point where it's like, I've, I think I've taken it down in the past before and I've just thought, why was I taking this down? And I put it back up. I took it down for now and we'll see what happens. But honestly, it's, it's not really a big deal because it's a, it's a very super niche that I think no one even does anymore. 
So it's not going to draw any interest towards right. it. Right, and, and obviously the other question is, when I have a guest on, I say I work with the publicist to get mm -hmm. them on the show. The publicist asked me to do that for them. The question is, how interesting is this publicist? Certain publicists that are bigger names than others and have bigger names under who are their clientele. If they have a big clientele, maybe I'll, I'll do them the favor and shut it down because I, want, I don't want to lose the publicist. Mm -hmm. But I've had some publicists who made some weird demands of shit and they were like, nobodies. And I just kind of blew them off. I was like, ah. You know, what are you going to do? Not bring me your client of who's like 45,000 ranking on IDMB. <laughs> you know, I, I'll survive without you. You know, move on. I guess from my perspective is that it's, you know, I've never had somebody come on and say, hey, can you remove that? I did have one person say, I didn't like my interview. Can we redo it? Hmm. And I'm like, dude, this is free. You're just wasting more time. <laughs> like, I'm more concerned about my own reputation than I'm about their reputation. Right. So it's for me, it's like, it literally costs me nothing if I just take it. Yeah, sure. Why not? But like you said, make it unlisted. And that still might be able to help your stats, I guess, too, is I got nothing. Yeah. I of course I can, I, of course I can take it down for you, man. I'm not gonna, I'm not, it, it's it, in the long run, it's, it's easier to win the war than, than lose, you know, lose a battle than it is to win the war. So yeah. it's like, yeah. Yeah. The fact that he hasn't been on at all. You know, it's just one of these one-offs that 500 people saw and that was it. It was like, all right, cool. Whenever he searches his name, it pops up. I'm like, isn't that a good thing usually? <laughs> like if you're, if you're vain enough to search your own name, you know, to figure out what's what's showing up on the internet about yourself, then then awesome. But Well, right. I mean, it's also something like that though, shouldn't be on any more shows. I mean, if, if I knew who the guy was, I knew that's what he did to you. I probably wouldn't bother getting him on my show because he wouldn't mm -hmm. be worth the effort. And something like that will cost himself... I'm sure the podcast community isn't that massive. I mean, there's there's less and less of us all the time, it seems like. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, over 10 million podcasts currently. And, you know, how many survive past episode 10? But... I will say, and I will just to add that point, as a publicist who constantly contacts podcasts to put guests on, the number that still exists in a year is so much smaller. Like, if I look at the podcast who... I contacted three years ago and the ones I still I contact now, you know, there's not a whole lot that I carry over. Most of them have shut down, gone on, you know, leave, life got in the way or whatever the reasons they have. You know, it's a small enough community and that guy's going to get caught um, that he's people are not going to want him on the show. And I told you about that story that I had with that guy who yeah. like emailed me. He's like, you know, um, I watched that episode and I make a little squeak sound on that chair. I can go back and edit that stuff out and stuff like that. He kept, it was like, I think I said what, it was like five times. So I've only said like final draft um, yeah i've ever said that yeah, yeah it, it, you know you gotta be a little careful you can't let these people's ego either though because someone who does do that to you is going to be that kind of person who's going to do that again and again that stuff should be shut down because my life is not going to be centered around this a jackass guest who's mm -hmm. going to tell me when they can put something up not put something up and like i said unless there's something either legally a legal issue with it yeah. or there's a reason why i want to talk to the you know i don't want to lose the public or some other benefit i must admit i'm thinking to myself just you know, I spent four hours to do this job. I'm not wasting it for 40 pounds. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that that happened to me as well, too, with the that same guest you were talking about. You know, he messages me, and by the time you release this, my, my crowdfunding campaign is going to be done and gone. I said, yeah, no, I, I realized that. And I, and I told you in my terms of service, and I told you in my in the actual, at the end of the interview, that, you know, this will get posted when it gets posted. So with that forethought in mind, I actually took the time to edit out everything in regards to your crowdfunding campaign. But I kept your main content in because it was it was great information that other people that are in that industry would would enjoy learning about. You know about your process yeah. and the actors and blah blah blah, etc. Never messaged me back or anything like that. So probably never even shared it whatsoever. And it's not like I care, but it was good content, and I and I posted. But I took six hours to edit that. I'm not going to just not release something because it doesn't coincide with your crowdfunding campaign. I was going to say what you're talking about. I, I, I got some advice. The, the listeners and viewers, we have a group chat that we're all part of. And I had one guy, super nice comic creator. Love the guy. The guy is a, amazing, super nice. Like he's the kind of guy that I bet if I was out driving in my in my car you know blew a tire he'd come out and help you know put the tire back on nice guy super nice guy he says can i come back on i have a new kickstarter coming out and i said geez um listen uh he's been he, uh, he's been on the show like you know two or three times already and so 
I've never been one to turn people down, but I, 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 I kind of soft turned them down by saying, listen, I basically, I said like my media manager mentioned that I shouldn't have anybody come back on the show. Who's had less than 50 views on their, their video. I'm like, so I'll tell you what, before September comes around, boost those interviews I did with you on YouTube and make sure it gets up there and then we'll you'll be able to come back on cuz i it 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 pains me when somebody comes on and just doesn't promote yeah. the the videos after the fact yeah. it yeah. also comes back to our our and i hate to say this and this is not putting anyone down because i do enjoy everyone that comes on the show but it comes back to the the clientele who we have on the show as our guests um, yeah. If they don't bring their following or if they don't really have a following, then there's not much we can do about it. So right. I've barely had interviews that reach past 100 views. I, I'm lucky if they hit 30. I mean, I, I will say having my quality of guests ranges quite a bit from extremely indie to some people that you would most people would know. Um, and I'll say indie guests, indie combo guests don't will draw 20, 20, 10 to 20 views for me. That's pretty much what they're, they're going to get. Uh, my lowest ever number is um, in the comic book guests as well. I think, and they've never hit, you know, uh, higher than I think my biggest one's like 57, maybe 60 at most. And I can't remember who, uh, a couple of them because they had a pretty good following. They had their own show and stuff like that. You can say what you want about indie uh, comic books and what podcasts should do for indie, but indie creators do not watch the shows um, of each other. They don't promote the shows of each other very well whatsoever, and they're not promoting themselves very well, uh, mm -hmm. which means there's less of us. And that's why shows that um, do indie usually fall, or they trans transition to the um, like the movie reviews ones. You know, oh, we talk about the new episode of the Acolyte, blah blah blah. And you're just like, okay, but you stop. You're not doing what you used to do because that wasn't where the views were. And um, so, yeah, it's the same reason why um, Artist Alley doesn't sell conventions, no, like, indie conventions anymore, because people weren't going to the tables to go to Artist Alley. They're going for the celebrity. Mm -hmm. And that's how it goes. Mm -hmm. Artist Alley is basically just there as a courtesy, it seems like. It's not there because for as a business model. Some creators, though, do really well in Artist Alley. And I'm not talking just the popular ones. There are some people that get a cult following or enough of a following that they can at least break even, if not make a tiny bit of money. But the combo people or are these the people who are creating the prints and the artwork because artists do okay they sell the artwork but we're not talking about people what i can say the people who are actually selling a comic book though tend not to get that same level of attention yeah i think it depends on on the comic book itself and it yeah. depends on the following and, and what, how they do and the various social media platforms but i mean that that's changed a lot since you know five ten years ago if at most i mean because there's such an in inundation of of AI artwork that are flooding these artist alleys now and conventions having to literally take down like entire booths because of it. And I've seen, now it'll be interesting to see how San Diego comic-con at least at the end of July, what they do or how they deal with that type of stuff. I'd love to kind of follow that. Well, Kickstarter just got that. involved recently with that. Didn't they, didn't they have, didn't they just shut down a campaign because they said AI art was being used to uh, create the artwork. I think they just shut it down a campaign not too long ago. Oh, it's possible. I haven't I haven't seen anything about that, but I'll definitely I mean, look that up. DC had to pull a whole print run of uh, of bearing covers because they said that was based on AI art. So I can't remember how many they were, but they were a whole bunch of DC covers. They're like, do you know how they do like the variants across like a yeah. the thing? They were like, they were, most of it was um, AI or thought to be AI. I don't think they even had proof. They just was told that it was, yeah. and they shut down all those covers. They were going to um, redo it. Even Magic the Gathering had a, a variety of artists that were well yeah. well established that had AI art that was being used, and it's just like it's it's everywhere, and it's just like how you know how can you deal with it? But we'll we'll save that for another conversation. We're at the final little bit of our show here. Let's kind of wrap up in terms of what's happening. Uh, by the way, who's who's hosting it next? Because I think it was who did it last. Um, it's Barn because I, I do end of the year. Okay, all right. So Barnes, well, Barnes. I did my in March so technically it was always good we we need a we need, we need a fourth, a fourth. <laughs> we need a fourth again yeah so three months here I'm, I'm doing it um this problem is finding someone who's you really really interesting enough to talk to <laughs> as a group <laughs> I mean there's some people who I drop some names in I don't know I don't know who who's a proper fourth 
unless unless right. we space it every four months and you know we we go that route it's not like it's a bad situation instead of every three months do it every four months until yeah. we until or, or, we find or, or, the fourth or cody can yeah. come on and show up <laughs> yeah yeah if cody is available he's been super busy obviously with with his own life and things like that um yeah, real real quick, Kurt. I just wanted to bring up that that point that you guys were just talking about oh, about the the guests. It reminds me of that we, you know, at the radio station, we'll do remotes where we will show up and we we, we charge to have people come and do their remotes. And so one one person asks to say, "Hey, I, I'm having a sale at my store. Can you come and do a remote?" And our response is always, "Listen, don't plan on the remote to bring." So people, if you ever listen to local radio, you might hear, yeah, we're at the, you know, we're at the dealership and blah, blah, blah. And we're cooking hot dogs. It's better if we do it, if we go to an event to help add to the ambiance of it. But if you want a remote to actually bring in new customers, that's not what our job is. And it's exactly what you're talking about too, when you mentioned before about, you know, having the the guest. It's like our job is to, as as podcasts, our job is to give you added value to your whatever you're doing and then like i say it, it bugs me that we spend all the time working on these working on these things we're, we're basically creating media for creators to utilize and when they don't utilize it it's kind of a kick in the pants sometimes we have people come on that actually benefits us like having a bigger name come on benefits us but when you're actually somebody comes in and asks hey can i come on your show um yeah but you better share these <laughs> you better share this so yeah yeah, yeah it, it's difficult um but it's something that we we've all at least found some way to to make it through <laughs> uh right yeah whether, whether it's uh for, for one more quarter. quarter yeah at least for one more quarter right so uh, what's happening in, in the next couple of months it's going to be in december yeah okay. yeah i'm in december i'm the end of year extravaganza <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do have my uh, my my sixteenth anniversary is on August eighth, so I'll be doing a live live show for that if I'm not working. Uh, so I'll probably do like an hour on August eighth of twenty twenty four, just to kind of a YouTube live stream. So I'll do that. To, oh, very cool. Just to kind of yeah. keep that consistency and just chat with whoever shows up. So that's my 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 main upcoming gig. <laughs> All right, Bernie, you're up. I guess so. For for me, it's that I am. Doubling down on making sure that I have my, uh, but I, I I redo I re-edit my interviews that are from Vermont artists and authors, and I put them specifically on the Vermont artists and authors. Same thing with the children's books. That seems to have been giving me a lot more traction, um, having that. But my goal is to you know you know crack that five hundred that five hundred subscriber, which you guys have been do, been there years ago. And and I'm gonna to try to see if there's a way to monetize this. You know, I'm trying to find ways to get sponsorships for this too. So, being able to utilize my daytime business on how getting sponsors and just like, but creating value. So like, this is the value for it. But you know, that's yeah. I'm that would be my my guess, my take. Oh, and Jeff, I'm having my uh, my Kickstarter, so I might have to reach out to you. I, my right. daddest jokes is oh, nice. trying to get that out the fall. I'm, I'm always yeah. I'm always available for um, some publicist work, so keep me posted. <laughs> I always always enjoy working with you. Um, <laughs> but for me, uh, in July, I got uh, some of these. Everyone shows up. Um, well, I had um, just uh, Gary Anthony Williams will release. He's doing Batman: The Cape Crusader. Um, the voice uh, he does one of the voice from the characters. Um, I got Peggy Lou from Venom 3 will come on uh, a few months early, so that'll be interesting. Um, Dan DiDio, the uh, comic book guy, James Adomian, who does the voice of Bane in the Harley Quinn uh, cartoon, is nice. coming up. Um, David Hewlett's coming back, who's a bit, uh, who I like. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Jane's coming back for a second uh, visit. Awesome. I'm excited. Uh, Samantha Gl- uh, Glasner from The Ark. And Bill Ratner, the voice of Flynn from the original G.I. Joe cartoon, will be on in the uh, beginning of August. So oh, that's what I got so far. <laughs> that's that's amazing. I love it. <laughs> mm. Well, let's uh, let's wrap up the show with your closing outros, as you guys normally do for your shows. And uh, let's have fun at our next gathering, whenever that may be. I don't know. Um, I don't have, I don't have one. I know, I've never okay, had an outro. I got to get that. All, so all these but years. after all this, I don't, but I, but, but I can say we're recording this on July 3rd. So I can say, Hey, England, have fun at work tomorrow. <laughs> 
Well, Barney, we're putting you on the spot right now. You have five seconds to come up with an outro for yourself, for your show. Yeah. Five seconds. Come up with something. Go All right. right. Don't forget to brush your teeth and brush your hair and make sure you don't get the brushes mixed up. Here. There we go. <laughs> uh, it's a work in progress. I guess so. That's all right. Next year, Barney, next year. Just, just chat right, GPT um, and outro. Yeah. I should. That's your job. For now on, your 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 goal. We're gonna ask you every day now if you have an outro yet. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I came with my outro. It took two and a half years, but I came up with mine. Uh, thank you for listening to another episode of the Traverse the Stars, or in this case, Two Geese Talking. Uh, please help me battle or us battle the algorithms by liking and subscribing. And until next episode, travel on. That ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking, the quarterly podcasting crew event of the year. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,000, 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com, or our YouTube channel, because that is definitely always updated, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is at twogeekstalking.podbean.com, or just search Two Geeks Talking, that's T-W-O, wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.